This is Space Time Series 24, Episode 115, for broadcast on the 11th of October 2021. Coming up on Space Time, it's all systems go for the launch of the Lucy mission of the Trojan asteroids. Curtin University's Binar 1 satellite now in orbit, and there's a new meteor shower in the sky. Say hello to the Arids. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Mission managers at NASA say all systems are go for this week's launch of the Lucy spacecraft, which will explore Jupiter's mysterious Trojan asteroids. Named after characters in Greek mythology, these asteroids circle the Sun in two swarms, with one group leading ahead of Jupiter in its orbital path, while the other trolls behind the gas giant. Lucy will be the first spacecraft to visit these vast asteroid fields. By studying these Trojans up close, scientists hope to hone their theories on how our solar system's planets formed 4.6 billion years ago, and how they ended up in their current configuration. NASA project scientist Tom Stadler says Lucy will fly to eight never-before-seen asteroids in 12 years. Following all pandemic protocols, Lucy team members have spent the past eight weeks at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida making final preparations to the spacecraft for flight. Engineers have tested all the spacecraft's mechanical, electrical and thermal systems. They've practiced executing the launch sequence from both the Missions Operations Center at Kennedy and Lockheed Martin Space in Littleton, Colorado. In early August, engineers installed the spacecraft's high-gain antenna. That'll be its most prominent feature after its extensive solar arrays, and it will allow Lucy to communicate with Earth. Then, on September the 18th, propulsion engineers finished filling Lucy's fuel tanks with some 725 kilograms of liquid hydrazine and liquid oxygen, which will make up some 40% of the mass of the spacecraft. That fuel will be used for the precise maneuvers needed to propel Lucy to its asteroid destinations, while the solar arrays, each the size of a school bus, will recharge the batteries that power the spacecraft's instruments. Engineers have now powered up all Lucy spacecraft systems in preparation for mission launch. At this stage, Lucy slated to blast off on Saturday aboard a United Launch Alliance Atlas V-401 rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Oh, and by the way, that name Lucy? Well, the spacecraft's named after the famous 3.2 million-year-old Australopithecus hominid discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. That's because, like Lucy, the Trojans could reveal fossil secrets about planetary formation. Once in flight, the 1,500-kilogram spacecraft will use two gravity-assist slingshot maneuvers, one in 2022 and the second in 2024, to gain enough energy to reach its ultimate destination. In 2025, it'll fly past the inner main belt asteroid 52246 Donald Johansson, which is named after the discoverer of the Lucy hominid fossil. Then in 2027, it'll arrive at the Lagrangian L4 Trojan cloud, which orbits about 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter's orbit around the Sun. There, the spacecraft will fly past four Trojans, 3548 Eurobates, together with its satellite, 15094 Polymeal, 11351 Leucris, and 21900 Aurus. After these flybys, Lucy's trajectory will take it back past the Earth in 2031. There, it'll receive a third gravity assist. This will fling it towards the Lagrangian L5 Trojan cloud, which trails about 60 degrees behind Jupiter in its orbit. There, it will visit the binary Trojan 617 Patroclus, together with its satellite Menoetius, in 2033. Officially, that'll bring the 12-year mission to an end. But the thing is, at that point, Lucy will be in a stable six-year orbit between the L4 and L5 clouds. And so chances are the mission will be extended if possible. Lucy's science payload includes a panchromatic and color visible imager and infrared spectroscopic mapper. That'll measure silicates, ices and organics on the asteroid surfaces. 
There's also a high-resolution visible imager designed to provide the most detailed images of the surface of the Trojans. A thermal infrared spectrometer to study the thermal characteristics of the Trojans, thereby providing data on the composition and structure of surface materials. And there'll be a radio science investigation to determine the mass of the Trojans by using the spacecraft's radio telecommunications hardware and its high-gain antenna to measure Doppler shifts. And so as we go to air this evening, the final countdown continues. This is Space Time. Still to come, Curtin University's Bina 1 spacecraft now in orbit, and there's a new meteor shower in the sky. Say hello to the Arids. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Curtin University's Bina 1 spacecraft has now been released into orbit from the International Space Station. The satellite was shot into the vacuum of space from an airlock aboard the Japanese Kibo Science Module. The 1.5 kilogram spacecraft was flown to the International Space Station aboard the SpaceX CRS 23 Dragon cargo ship, which had launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida in late August. Binar 1 is the first of seven satellites Curtin University are planning to send up over the next 18 months. Mission scientist Professor Phil Bland says the spacecraft will be used to evaluate new electronics, which will ultimately be incorporated into a new lunar mission, which he slated to fly in 2025. Jack, for the Japanese Space Agency, gave us a live feed from the space station and from their mission control, and, uh, and so we could see it all like ready to go. And they actually got us to say go when it was ready to go, and that was really exciting. And then we saw it get blipped out into space, which was just amazing. And then to see the satellites, there were three deployed at the same time against the clouds looking down from space was just, just awesome, really special moment. So how do they actually deploy them? Because you're in space, there's a vacuum there. So they've got a, a in the, the Japanese, module on the space station is called Kibo and they've got a like a little kind of airlock there for this purpose and then there's a robot arm that brings out the kind of rack or a box that contains the small satellites and that line that takes them out of the space station lines them up correctly and then they it's like a spring it's literally just a spring mechanism then send them off different direction uh, with a slightly different orbit and then they're flying free in space. So uh, that all gets loaded up by an astronaut, by a Japanese astronaut on the space station. And he was lovely. He actually uh, sent us a message, WA for spacecraft, uh, good luck and uh, all the best for the future. Those weren't his exact words, but uh, they're pretty close. It was really kind. And so what happens now? Are you getting telemetry from the satellite or set up period or what happens? Yeah, so basically, so now what we've got to do, we're listening for it. So we've still not heard from it. This can take like a few days. It can actually take a couple of weeks for, uh, and, uh, and so we're still listening and we're still waiting to get that first message from the spacecraft. Fingers crossed we do. If we, you know, we'll, it can be that, like people have waited weeks to hear from the thing. If there's been a, like a kind of a fault, like, you know, fully discharged batteries and it takes a long, long time to get charged up again or a partially deployed antenna that fixes itself and take quite a long time so uh, so we'll keep on listening it might take might take a couple of weeks fingers crossed we pick it up that would be really lovely obviously but uh, but we're still in that phase where we're trying to we're trying to find it you're not worried yet uh, no and uh, and I think you know if uh, there's actually um, you know especially if it's like your first one for uh, CubeSats then uh, then there's a pretty solid failure rate I think the thing that makes us different two things makes us different one is that it's fully like we've built this whole thing ourselves is quite a different technology so there's obviously an issue you know not an issue but there's a thing there that we need to validate and test and check and the other thing is that it's a program right so this isn't a kind of a one-off 
experiment. I, you know, when we were getting this whole thing moving, it's critical to me that all the stuff that our people learn, our students learn, is, you know, we've built up that that knowledge now. We want to be able to use that going forward to train more students who are coming in, develop that that kind of in-house expertise and capability. So I would be disappointed if this one didn't work, but uh, it's a learning process and we've got three more that are going to go up in the middle of next year and another three not too long after that. And that's part of the program. That's why it's good to be able to see that on the horizon and increase those capabilities as we go forward. So uh, I'm quite comfy. Now, Bino One is testing a, a new circuit board, one that combines various functions, which would normally be on separate circuit boards on satellites. Yes. But this is putting it all on the one board. And if it works, it's going to be used on a mission to the moon. So, yeah. So it's really the first test of this like innovation of ours of kind of put in uh, everything on a single circuit board. So first time that we're testing that. And then what will happen is because now if we can show that that works, then if we validate that in orbit, every other launch uses that same technology, but we kind of iterate it, make it more in terms of the capabilities that it has, more capable and every launch we validate it a bit further. And yeah, there's a three years time, fingers crossed, we'll have a version of it is we're comfortable can live at the moon for three months and do our mission, like do our mission concept that we want to send to the moon, which NASA is excited about as well. So that would be awesome. Yeah, that's the, the kind of big medium term step for our program. And that's going to be looking for what minerals on the lunar surface? Yeah, so it's going to be, it's looking for minerals and also looking for accessible water on the lunar surface. So we, we're going to do a bit of both. And both of those things go towards NASA's strategy for the Artemis program, which is their like moon to Mars program. And that's also how Australia is collaborating with NASA. So uh, Australia's moon to Mars program as well. So we're kind of it's called in situ resource utilization. And that's what we're helping with. We're helping with kind of where are those resources that astronauts will be able to use um, both to explore the moon and then out elsewhere in the solar system. Main one is water, because if we can find ice, then you can turn that into hydrogen and oxygen, as well as uh, life support. You get propellant out of that. You get rocket fuel out of that. So if we can make our own rocket fuel on the moon, then uh, we can go wherever we like in the solar system. That's the key to Mars, isn't it? Exactly. It would be an incredible step in uh, human space exploration. It's 2,000 tons or something of fuel to get to the moon with Apollo 11. I can't remember what the exact number was. It's like 20, 30 tons to get back. And that's the difference of trying to get out of the Earth's gravity and down onto the moon versus the moon's gravity and then down onto Earth. So being able to fly from the moon, fuel up there and just utilize the ice that's there and then fuel up there and go other places makes life an awful lot easier. So that's the exciting part of this. If we can help with that, that would be tremendous. Controlling Binar 1, how is that done? Is that just in the olden days, you'd have a whole mission control with dozens of people in front of uh, (laughs) computer screens. I take it these days it's a lot simpler than that with, uh, what, just a laptop or... It's still, I mean, there's still an element of that. So for us, we've got some stuff here at Curtin, and then we're also working with colleagues at Food Grow. They've set up an operations center, or they're building an operations center. They've got one currently at Nagara, and we're working with them on the operations side. So they've got a beautiful operations center that they also use for undersea vehicles and remote operating vehicles. And they're setting up a new one just for space applications. So it's working with them as well on that. But kind of they will be able to operate aspects of the spacecraft and develop protocols for those operations. So we can help each other with that sort of program. And of course Bino One isn't the only Aussie satellite up there right now. That's right. So uh, so colleagues from University of Sydney have uh, have sent up one called Quava and uh, and that's part of their program as well. Their main focus is on payloads. Ours is mainly on at the moment is on uh, on developing what we call the platform. Um, but yeah, but those colleagues have sent theirs up as well. It's a little bit bigger than ours. It got deployed uh, just I think a few minutes, maybe an hour later. So. Uh, so fingers crossed for them that they have a successful mission as well. That's Professor Phil Bland from Curtin University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, we say hello to a new meteor shower, the Arids. 
And later in the Science Report, science's highest awards, the Nobel Prizes in Physics, Chemistry and Medicine, have been handed out in Stockholm. All that and more still to come on Space Time. October is already a busy month with three major meteor showers. There's the Draconids, produced by the comet 21P Giovanni Zina, the Taurids, generated by the comet 2P Enki, and the Orionids, which come from the comet 1P Halley. And now there could be a fourth. Say hello to the arid meteor shower, which may make itself known this week, if you're far enough south. The showers generated by debris from the short-period comet 15P Finlay. It reached perihelion on July the 13th as it travels on its six-and-a-half-year orbit around the Sun. Now, Earth's orbit intersects the comet's debris trail early this month. With the radiant, that is the apparent position in the sky where the meteors seem to originate from, being in the southern constellation of Ara, the altar. That's right ascension, 17 hours, 7 minutes, Declination, minus 57.5 degrees. Astronomers have been wondering for years why this nearby comet doesn't produce periodic displays of meteors. Well, the long wait appears to be over, with early observations looking promising following reports of 13 meteors an hour. And even if you miss out this year, chances are the arid meteor shower will grow as the debris trail spreads itself out over time. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. The 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics has been awarded to Siyukuru Manabe, Klaus Hasselmann and Giorgio Parisi in Stockholm. Manabe and Hasselmann were awarded for their research into global warming, physically modelling Earth's climate, quantifying variability and reliably predicting climate change. Parisi was given the award for the discovery of the interplay of disorder and fluctuations in physical systems, ranging from the atomic scale right up to planetary scales. Meanwhile, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry has been awarded to Benjamin List and David Macmillan for creating a tool to construct molecules which generated a new technique called asymmetric organocatalysis, which is now widely used for the production of drugs and other chemicals. The new technique, which was developed independently by each of the scientists, allows manufacturers to streamline drug production for things like depression and respiratory system infections. And David Julius and Adem Patapartain were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine for their discovery of receptors in the skin that sense temperature and touch. Their findings, which were also carried out independently, could pave the way for a new generation of painkillers. The work helped show how humans convert the physical impact from heat or touch into nerve impulses that allow you to perceive and adapt to the world around you. The only glitch was the poor journalism displayed by Australia's Channel 9 News, which described the award as the Nobel Peace Prize for Medicine. Maybe there was a two-for-one deal between Stockholm and Oslo that we don't know about. New research warns that the number of threatened Australian native bee species is expected to increase by nearly 500% as a direct result of the devastating black summer bushfires in 2019-2020. The findings, reported in the journal Global Change Biology, are based on a study of 553 invertebrate species. The study by scientists with Flinders University looked at about a third of Australia's known bee species to assess the long-term environmental damage caused by the disaster. Well, if you have a dog, you probably already know this, but new research shows that pooches are especially good with words, can learn the names of their toys at a speed and scale comparable to that of a one-year-old human child. A report in the Journal of the Royal Society Open Science says researchers recruited six border collies from across the world who already knew the names of many of their toys. These dogs went through several experiments where their owners were asked to teach them the names of new toys over a week. 
After a week, the dogs were tested by being asked to fetch their new toys from another room. Not only could the dogs memorise the name of 12 new toys with a high rate of success, five could still remember their names a month afterwards, and four could still remember after two months. A new study has found that the more people believe in conspiracy theories, the worse they perform on critical thinking tests. Conspiracy theories are nothing new. And of course, there are lots of real conspiracies out there, many nowadays propagated by the media itself to push a particular political cause, and the truth be damned. Critical thinking is the objective analysis and evaluation of the information you're given, and it requires a number of cognitive skills. This study assessed the critical thinking skills of 338 undergraduate students in France using a standard test, and it then scored the students' tendencies towards conspiracy beliefs as well as their personal assessment of their critical thinking skills. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says, The authors found a strong association between lower critical thinking skills and an increased tendency towards believing conspiracy theories. Yeah, it's a propensity to believe in conspiracies. Not everyone who believes in a conspiracy theory is lacking intelligence, but this particular bit of research made the earth-shattering discovery that more people who believe in conspiracy theories, the worse they perform on critical thinking tests. In other words, they're not able to look at the conspiracy claims very scientifically, or even sort of look at the theory behind them or the evidence, and they aren't able to assess the evidence put forward. So it's not necessarily lack of intelligence, but it's lack of critical thinking, which is something the skeptics talk about all the time. The issue is not what you believe, but how you believe it and uh, what efforts you put into believing something. If you apply critical thinking, which is something we do every day when we decide how to get to work or what clothes to wear or what fridge to buy, you're using critical thinking, but we don't use it when it comes to conspiracy theories and religions and that sort of stuff. Things we really want to believe in, critical thinking goes out the window. So uh, basically they're saying that people who believe conspiracy theories lack critical thinking, which is to me a no-brainer, quite frankly, if it's a forward slapper, but they do go into other areas in this research looking at perhaps the fact that critical thinking can be taught and should be taught and I've taught it at schools as a skeptic I've gone out to schools and talked about uh, critical thinking I've talked about the same thing with groups of pensioners as well you can teach critical thinking at any age so from the forward slapping people who believe in conspiracies don't aren't generally able to distinguish truth from falsity to the actual thing where you can be taught how to do that so as a process as an actual process you can apply when taking up or assessing any particular claim as I say you do it all the time when you're buying a fridge you decide how big who's the supplier what's the brand like can they deliver on time? What colour is it? Do I really want stainless steel? Blah, blah, blah. All those things. You're using critical thinking. You're making assessment of the evidence. You take up a conspiracy theory with a moon landing fake, and you look at the evidence and the evidence is pretty chunky and the debunking of that evidence is very convincing and yet you still believe it. That's obviously your critical thinking is being applied different places in different amounts. And so people who can believe conspiracies apparently don't do that. They don't apply critical thinking, which is sad because that's the the area where you should be, more so than the fridge, but still, that's the way people are. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, 
at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.